Uh, so it does go both ways. And uh, I, I just really appreciate what God is doing, what he's, um, the people he's sending. He's sent us some great people uh, to work with us. There was a day where we did everything pretty much, and then uh, Peggy showed up, and I think it's probably she prayed us here, <laughs> and I'm thankful for that, so. <laughs> so thank you, Jesus. Well, I want to, um, I told Lee I'm going to do the tithe and offering tonight, and, and I wanted to build a little bit last week, last week's um, Kim brought the tithe and offering, and one of the, and we kind of did it together, but one of the things we were establishing is uh, we've just kind of run into this again afresh here in the last couple weeks, and we had some people tell us uh, they made some strong statements, and so I started thinking about this, and I'm, I'm just like, I started stewing and stewing, and, and, and I can't stop stewing on this, but here's some of the uh, statements we come across. I don't believe in the prosperity gospel. I hate the, the prosperity gospel. So I started stewing on that. And I'm going, well, then we have problems with Bible verses. And, and I understand a little what, where they're coming from, potentially, but yet their heart's not right. And, and there is... Um, what they do is they hate the people that abuse and use the gospel incorrectly. That's what they don't like. But let me tell you, if you don't believe that the gospel prospers you, then you have a huge issue on how God works. You know, I was just thinking about it this afternoon. I'm like, how you reconcile Solomon? Would Solomon be allowed in your church? Wasn't he the most prosperous man that ever lived? Is he allowed in your house? Is he allowed in your church? Is he, are, you, are you allowed to associate with Solomon? And, and now we also, there's warnings and we're going to get into some of these things. So last week we kind of established one of the things that I, re, I see when people come against and say, I don't like the prosperity gospel. One of the biggest problems is that you already are prosperous. So, and that's kind of hard for us to take because uh, Christians have fallen into uh, comparison problems. And so they immediately compare themselves to somebody wealthier than them and they say, well, no, I'm not rich like that person. Well, see, if you go down that route, the people that say, well, I hate the prosperity gospel, you know, if we bring, uh, 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 we, we actually last week, uh, some of you weren't here, but Pastor Billy from Uganda was here. And Pastor Billy actually came up here, and he actually said, you know, you guys should uh, thank God for the prosperity that you have in your life. He's seen poverty. He has seen firsthand the devastation of poverty. And, and, and so um, if you get into comparison, well, I'm not wealthy like that person, or I'm not wealth, or I, I don't have... I'm not rich like this other person I know. Then you fall into the trap of comparing and you can't ever come to uh, an end to that because you can always take some poor man from, Af from the bushes of Africa and he will walk into your house right now and say, wow, you are blessed. And then what happens is, what, 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 here's the danger in this. When people reject the prosperity side of the gospel because the gospel prospers, and I'll show you, I'll show you verses uh, to back this up, the gospel prospers you. Like it's meant to make your life better. And, and, and one of the lies is, you know, this, this I don't believe in the prosperity gospel only works for the two hours on Sunday that you're in church. The rest of the week, you try to prosper yourself. Am I right or am I right? You go to work, and what do you do at your job? You try to prosper yourself so that you have more funds. And here's what ends up happening, is instead of believing that God prospers you, you begin to believe in you prospering you. 
See, and then, and then, that's, and, and then uh, that's actually dangerous, and it's incorrect, and it's error. And it all starts with re- the rejection of uh, God, uh, the pro- what, what some people say, well, I despise or I hate the prosperity gospel. Part of the reason I'm talking about this is because if you despise it and if you hate the prosperity of, go- of the gospel, of the good news, then you begin to reject the blessing of God in your life and you become unthankful. See, right now, uh, we need to be even more thankful for what we have. See, we are already just by living and being born into this country. I don't care how poor you are. There is not another government on, on earth that takes care of, of their people as much as the American government. So you can have literally have be the poorest person, be homeless, and you still got a card to swipe to go get groceries. And, and in fact, one of the things that I see... I go over to Ukraine quite a bit, and um, one of the things they do is they have outreaches in their local park, and they serve soup. Well, these poor people, they show up because they literally have nothing else, so they're happy for the soup. You try that here, and Kim and I uh, and our family, we served down at the homeless shelter, and we'd make food, and you would, couldn't believe the complaining that people had coming through because it wasn't made to their specifications, and they were homeless. I mean, it was eye-opening. And you're scratching your... And finally, Kim's like, forget making things from scratch. They just like stuff out of the box. So you made box potatoes and box cake and, I mean, anything that come out of a box, that's what you made, and they loved it. They were like, oh, that was a great dinner tonight. And, and you know, they didn't like nice, uh, actually healthy, cooked-up meals, right? So uh, we are, we, and part of establishing that we're blessed, it brings thankfulness into our life. And now, now you can take the verses for yourself and apply it for you on the warnings of money. See, if you don't establish that you're already blessed and you're in the comparison mode, you read the warnings of money and you say, well, that's just for those other people. You never apply it to you. It's always for the person in Aspen building a 15,000 square foot house. It's for that guy, right? And it never applies to you. So all Scripture is given to us. So, so those warnings on money are for me. And it's not the money that's the issue. What's the issue? It's the love of it. It's the trust in it. it it's the love and the trust. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, and uh, chapter 7, He says, lay up treasure where? Where? How do you do that? How do you lay up treasure in heaven? Giving people the gospel and also directly by giving. See, part of alms, you know why um, um, you're not supposed to talk about who you give alms to? You know, that is one area that you're not supposed to declare from the street corner on who you give alms to. You know, who, you know why? The longest time I couldn't figure it out, um, and, and I started, uh, I, I may have been through some of the things I've read and processed, but the alms, the reason you're not to shout from the, from the, uh, from the street corner that you gave alms because it embarrasses the poor person. So that's why you're not supposed to let the right hand know what the left hand gives in almsgiving. But we also know there's multiple different types of giving and we need to understand giving. But what happens when we're blessed and we begin to understand giving, it purifies our heart. It purifies you. And you begin to get detached from the money and realize it's no different than, the, than a tool that you use at work. It's, you use a hammer to drive in. Well, you probably don't use a hammer anymore. Well, they, the fancy things, you like, like they have battery nail guns now, right? You don't, even need, you don't even need an air hose and an air compressor, right? So it's a tool. That's a tool to help your job go faster and better. 
Money becomes a tool that's here for you to use and you become emotionally detached to it so that you can now further the gospel. Am I making sense? I think some of you are, I, I see light bulbs go on. Right? It's not that money is inherently evil. It can be used for a lot of evil things. Same way your car can be used for evil, the internet can be used for evil, your phone can be used for evil. It, it's a tool that can be used for good. And we ought to be here, we're here blessed to bring the gospel, the good news to the world. And in fact, we actually kind of bear, uh, uh, there's a side of responsibility that we, because we were given so much to be born here. And to recognize and not reject it. That's what grieves me when people reject um, the prosperity side of, gospel, of the gospel. You know, really, um, you just, it's the gospel. So go, go to Luke chapter 4, and, and let's just analyze what, what Jesus said. What, so in Mark chapter 16, in Mark chapter 16, uh, it says to go into, it's the Great Commission, right? It says go into all the world and preach what? The gospel. Uh, what's the gospel again? It's good news, right? It's the good news. What, are, what is the good news f- for? See, a lot of times religion has taught that we are simply selling fire insurance. People know by what, what I mean when I say that term. In other words, we're just telling them how they don't escape hell. And that is a part of it. But that's just a little part of it. It's not just to escape hell, it's to do so much more. So Matthew chapter, or sorry, Mark chapter 16 tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? Well, here in Luke chapter 4, Jesus gets up in front of uh, all of his relatives, and he gets up in, in, in Nazareth, and in, in chapter um, 4, verse 18, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has anointed Jesus to preach the gospel to the poor. So what is a good news to a poor person? Fire insurance. You know what? Like if you would, if, if you would try to sell a poor person that has a shack, and because and, and, he's poor, right? And you try to come up and you're an you're a insurance salesman. And he comes up and you go up to him and say, you know what, I, I, I want to sell you this policy for, so, so that if your house burns, you know, I'm, I'm going to take some money from you. I know you're poor, but I'm taking this money so that if your house burns, you could rebuild. You think the poor person really cares? Well, there is a part of fire insurance or being rescued from what he deserved going to hell that's a good thing, but it's not just being rescued from hell, that's the gospel. It's all of this. See, Jesus came to uh, give good news to the poor, but He also uh, was sent to heal their broken heart. See, every phrase here, these people, uh, anybody that takes this verse gets prospered. See, He sent me to heal the broken heart, hearted, not to stay broken hearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. In other words, if you are, are capti- captive to fear and any type of bondage, you can be liberated. Right? It's, it's prospering them. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. And uh, is it verse 19? Or we don't have the rest of it up here. Uh, to proclaim... To set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, if you want to do a study, we're not going to get into this tonight, but the acceptable year of the Lord is actually the year of Jubilee. See, in, 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 in Old Testament, he, uh, in, in, during, uh, the, under the Hebrew law, they had, what they, had, they had what you called the year of Jubilee. It happened every 50 years. Debts were forgiven. Everything was restored to the owner. It's absolutely amazing. It's a prosperous year. Now, that is all fulfilled now in Jesus. Now, every year is the Jubilee year. For you. Part of the reason I'm addressing this is you will carry shame and guilt for being prosperous. 
and you won't know what to do with it. And so then people will do things. I, I know the ladies uh, love when I pick on them. Uh, but, you know, they'll do things. that they're, I, I know people that are very prosperous. They'll make sure they shop at a yard sale and tell you what for deal they got because it soothes their conscience. They could easily pay for it brand new several times over, but, but it's a deal to them. And so they take pleasure in telling you, see, it's because their, their conscience cannot reconcile the guilt because they already are prospered, so now we have to find things at a deal. In fact, some people take it so far that they, they will actually um, uh, take advantage of people. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to find a deal. Actually, good businessmen find deals, right? So it's okay to find a good deal, but it is wrong to take advantage of people and then go brag to all your buddies what for deal you got when you had plenty of money to prosper that person. See, every time you make a transaction, you get receive some gain and another person can receive either no nothing because you got your deal or you can stop quibbling about what it costs and say, you know what, there'll be more coming from that pipeline. I, I want to bless this person. And it starts changing your mentality of what the good news really is. Amen? So I, hopefully I gave you some things to think about. Here's another verse. I, I know I didn't uh, turn to a whole lot of verses. 3 John 2. Let's put that up here. Let's, let's re read 3 John 2. Let's just get this in our spirit. 3 John 2, what does it say? It says, Above all things, above all else, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in hell, health, not hell, health, just as your soul prospers. Amen? Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. God wants you to prosper in all things. In all things. But it is going to be according to your understanding and how your soul prospers. Hopefully I gave you some things that you can process a little different. Now here is three scripture verses for warnings. And I'm going to give them to you so that you don't say, Pastor was unbalanced tonight. I'm going to give you these three scripture verses. You're going to have to go... Uh, and look at them. It's uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 19, and, it, and 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 11, and James 5, 1 through 6. And it's simply, I'll give you the context of those scripture verses. It's talking about the trust and the love of money, and if you trust these things, how they will let you down. And it's not about putting your treasure, because where your, Jesus said, where your treasure is, where's your heart? It's right where your treasure is. So, so if you put your treasure on earthly things, it will ruin you. Amen? And we need to put our treasure in heavenly things and what He's asked us to do. And one of the ways is through our giving. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, let's stand to our feet. And we're going to, if you have your offering with you, uh, this is your wave offering. Wave it before the Lord. <laughs> Some of you wouldn't do well and in synagogues because that's what they did they brought their offering and they waved it in front of the priest why it was just showing their adoration to the lord right and and so again offering time is blessing the lord with what he's already blessed us with and it's a sliding scale of of how we perceive things and what the Lord speaks to us about, it's not set. Aren't you glad for that? It's a sliding scale of according to your faith. Amen? Father, we thank You for each person here that is willing to give. And Father, You've already blessed us with so many things. And Father, this is just a small return that we give back to You that, that we give back to your work and your kingdom to further it. To, as so, because we are going to see the day that your glory is going to be all over the earth. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Attach your faith to your offering. Well, we got Thanksgiving coming up. Another opportunity to give him thanks for what he's already done. Amen. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, tonight, I think I'm going to preach what I was going to preach last week. <laughs> if you weren't here last week, we never did have a sermon. <laughs> it just kind of happened, and, um, and playing a perfectly good sermon, I was sure ready to deliver it. And, and the Holy Spirit had some other ideas, and, and thank you, Jesus. was so glad to be able to bless Pastor Billy, and, um, and there's going to, I believe there's going to be some more connection there. Uh, Pastor Billy was here from Uganda. Uh, I didn't know he was going to be here. I, I just uh, felt by the Spirit of the Lord that he was supposed to say some things. And um, so thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just glad to be uh, a blessing to him, and I believe there'll be more in the future. Amen? I'm going to talk a little bit about current events um, before I get into the sermon. I believe that we should be aware of what's happening. There's times I kind of wish I wouldn't be as aware as I was, and uh, because of the temptation that it carries. And I just wanted uh, to give us... Um, just, just, Jesus said, I believe it was in Matthew chapter 26, that, uh, that there will be wars and rumors of wars. And then he says a profound statement. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Amen? So I just want to encourage you. If you've been troubled with all the things that have been happening and the rumors and and. You know, um, I believe our country is at probably the, one of the most dangerous places it's ever been. Why do I th say that? Because we've had a border to our south that has been wide, wide open. And there are people, um, there, it, don't believe the lie that it's just families, you know, dutifully coming across uh, with two or three children and they want a new life in America. There is criminals coming across. They know what they're doing. They're coming here. And why are they coming here? Because they are intent to do evil. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying that so that you understand the times we're in. And now, as Christians, we can do something about it. Amen? Amen. Like, I, we don't have to go cower in a corner. We don't have to go... Um, um, and the, here's the temptation for a lot of Christians. Uh, I used to be one of these that f fell into these temptations. Well, the Bible is what the Bible is, and we know that it's gonna, uh, there's things that are going to become worse. You can read about it, right? And so, well, it's just going to happen, so what are you going to do about it? Well, Scripture is interpreted, in other words, we need to uh, take Scripture and read it, and then we take other Scripture to understand it. So the same time you read Revelation, you have to read the Scripture verses that talk about fighting the good fight of faith. So even though it, it true, our country may be going to hell in a handbasket, like some people are saying, we fight the good fight of faith. And we don't stop fighting that faith just because something happens that we hear about. Well, you know, that's the fulfillment of prophecy, so I'm just going to watch the prophecy fulfill itself. No, that's not what you're called to do. You're called to make a difference in life. And I'm going to stand before God someday, and He's going to say, hey, you know, you were down there right there at the end of, the t of times. How did you handle yourself? Well, you know, I just folded my arms and I was like, well, Lord, you said it was going to happen, so I just let you do what you were going to do. That's not going to fly. That's not going to fly. You're going to take an account. He's going to, he takes into an account of how we handle ourselves on this earth. And so there's going to be seed time and harvest. There's going to be summer and winter all the way up to the end. Okay? We, 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 had a prom, we have a promise that says that. And we are to fight the good fight of faith all the way to the end. We don't stop fighting the good fight of faith. Well, I'm going to just roll right into my sermon because I've been, I've been talking about, um, my, the title of my series has been Fearless. Fearless. Can you live a life without fear? Yes, I believe you can. 
Now, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people are caught up in, um, they see things happening, they're afraid of it affecting them. And then because of that, they begin to say some wild statements. And, and we, I spent uh, at least one uh, service, if not two, talking about um, what people often say, Christians, I'm talking about Christians saying this, they talk about, well, we live in uncertain times. Well, what's uncertain? Did God fall off the throne and His promises aren't true anymore? No. So, so in other words, we still serve a certain God. And what He says and His promises remain the truth. And we actually have Scripture that tells us that He cannot lie. So He can't lie. God didn't fall off His throne. The angels didn't go AWOL. They're still around. And and He's made some of these. He's put promises in the Word and He's put them in you for you. And now it's up to us to exercise the Word. How do I exercise the Word? Yoga classes? Probably not. (laughs) How do you exercise the, the, the Word? You speak what God says. And here just recently, if you're interested, Sydney, Pastor Sidney Ropp came out here and he gave us four sermons named Declare a Thing. Very, very good on how do I pray? How do I use Scripture? It's got to come off my ma- out of my mouth. See, a lot of times we, we, we're like, yeah, we love the Scripture. Isn't Scripture amazing? It's great. Oh, the Holy Scriptures. And we'll have arguments how holy they are. And we'll have arguments on, on, on whether, you know, was it all done appropriately at the, uh, there's a certain council where they, uh, I forget the name of it now because I just literally don't care. And, and, and uh, there's a certain council where they decided what the books of the Bible actually are. And, and, you know, then we'll argue on what translation we ought to use. And is it the KJV only? Actually, you can't even use the KJV, uh, that's King James Version. There's actually a, because that version has 12 mistakes, there's actually a KJB. It's simply called King James Bible, and it's the only correct Bible. All the other Bibles you throw away. And we'll argue extensively over this, and we miss what he said. Because it's an intellectual argument. God didn't come just to excite my intellectual senses. He came to stir up faith in me. He came and gave His Word so that I can teach and preach and it is working on the inside of me and His Word works when I work it. But I have to work it with my mouth. And it's got to come out of my mouth. And so we declare and pray Scripture. Amen? We declare Scripture. So, in this declaring Scripture, we, can, we find that we serve a God that is certain in His ways. So when somebody says, well, we live in uncertain times, what's uncertain about it? Y- you. Yeah, you're right, honey. They are uncertain. They, they live in uncertain times because they're uncertain. Why are they uncertain? Because religion has taught us some things that we constantly say, and we're going to review some things tonight, in the uncertainty of God. And we have heard these little sayings from little on up. And and we still think this way, even though, oh, okay, so maybe I don't believe that really now, but that wells up in us. Because it's how we have thought for so many years. For example, any, anybody ever hear this? God works in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. And it's usually said in the context of what? Well, you'll just never know. 
what God's going to do. And we had a whole sermon on this. Some of you were here, some of you weren't. And, and, and I said, if God were a plumber, not a one of you would hire him. Because you don't know if he's going to fix your sink or if he's going to blow it up. Because God works in mysterious ways. And so would you, can you imagine the plumbing van going down the road and, and, and on the side of it says, you just never know what I'm going to do next. Would you hire that plumber? You would never hire that plumber. You'd never hire that electrician. But we say God's like that. He just works in mysterious ways. Here's another one. God's ways are just higher than your ways or our ways. And we say it with this holy attitude. You know, like we're convincing Him in the holiness of our statement. God's ways are just higher than ours. See, the problem with that statement is we've already established the fact that God's ways are higher than our ways. I wasn't trying to figure out higher ways than God. And neither were you. And really, when you read that verse in context, where they try to get it from, it's talking about the unrighteous person. How many know that God's ways are higher than an unrighteous man? How many know that since we're born again, we've been given what? what have, what's one of the gifts we've been given? We've been given the mind of Christ. Is God's ways higher than the mind of Christ you've been given? Now that doesn't mean you know everything. But it means that you can tap in and understand things that you couldn't understand before. And you can tap in and receive uh, understanding from heaven because you've been given the mind of Christ. Amen? That's now in you. That's who you are. See, a lot, a lot of times we'll walk around talking about, saying our problem, and, and you know, it can be as simple as, well, I just don't know. Well, I just don't know what to do. I just don't know. I just don't know. And guess what you end up having? You don't know. How about going around going, well, I've been given the mind of Christ. And you know what? Through that, I can, I can understand things in the Spirit. Amen? I've been given the mind of Christ. So through that, I can put a pull on the Spirit and, and we can get some things accomplished that otherwise we couldn't do on our own. Because we now have the mind of Christ. But by faith, I believe it. I believe those things by faith. Here's some more things. Well, we're just not promised tomorrow. Am I going around tipping some apple carts? Well, we're just not promised tomorrow. You know who's not promised tomorrow? You know who that applies to? Who does that apply to? The unsaved, the unrighteous person. No, they're not promised tomorrow. But what about the verses that talk about with long life, I shall satisfy you. Do we just start tearing that verse out of our Bible? See, th then we've got to go through theological um, 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 hoops on trying to, and, and then you, get into, you fall into this. Well, that's Old Testament. And I was even told this. Yeah, but that's from Psalms. You can't really take that like, like, like the rest of Scripture. And, and, and then I offended the person greatly because I said, well, if I can't take that verse in Psalms, then why would I take the rest of the Bible? And I gently tossed my Bible over on the couch and they were so horrified that would I, I would handle my, the, the Holy Scriptures with such irreverence. But you know what's horrifying? They don't believe what the Word says. That's actually what's horrifying. That's actually... See, what I did is I just kicked the religious devil. And it didn't like it. And it was exposed. And they got angry at me. Are we promised tomorrow? I have Scripture saying we are. What about honor your father and mother? I got New Testament Scripture. I got Old Testament Scripture, New Testament Scripture. We even, one of, a, one of the uh, um, sermons, we looked at, we, um, some Bibles have this white blank page in the middle, and I said, one of the things we ought to do is tear that out. Because we try to differentiate, is that Old Testament or is that New Testament? And we jump through 
theological hoops trying to figure these things out when we just need to take the word for what it says. Now, there is a discernment in interpreting Scripture with Scripture. So you can't just take a verse, talk about different doctrines. We taught at LTS this morning, uh, Lee and I did. And, and one of the things is if you, take a, if you want to make a doctrine out of something, one of the requirements for a doctrine, even God said it himself, that it's out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. So if you don't have two or three different places in the Scripture to come up with your holy grail of your doctrine that you're trying to do, then, then you shouldn't be doing it. Now, some people still can make a, a read into some things, and it often boils down to this. They don't know the character of God. They don't know the character. I want to ask you something. Would God require anything of you that He wouldn't do? Would God require you to perform different things on this earth that He Himself does not hold the standard? Well, some people think that. How do they think that? Because they'll blame God on different things that He does. If I would do it to a person, guess where I would be? I'd be in jail. But they say, well, you just never know. God works in mysterious ways, His wonders to perform. Or, maybe they say this, well, guess what, it's a blessing in disguise. It's a blessing in disguise. But, you know, maybe, it's a, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just a blessing in disguise. You just can't see it. Now, I'm pretty sure we're all wise enough to understand what a blessing is. And what a curse is. And we know what a blessing is and a curse is. And we got to stop pawning things we don't understand to, well, it's just something we don't understand. Because what it will do is create misunderstandings of God in your thinking. God said He changes not. He doesn't change. Why would He be one way in the Old Covenant and a completely different God in the new. He's not. Did you know that mercy and grace are also evident under the old covenant? There's many places there's mercy and grace. But you talk to some believers, it's like, no, 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 just Jesus brought mercy and grace. The old covenant, there was none. It was just the harsh brutality. Well, if you, you again, you've got to understand the covenant that God made with people. And then you've got to understand what the people said. The law, when, God, when Moses came down off Mount Sinai and gave the law, the people were like, well, you know, just tell us what to do and we'll do it. Except they couldn't. Right? They, they trapped themselves with their own mouth. Just tell us what to do and we'll do it. And so part of the reason this uncertainty of what God is doing, the reason I'm talking about this, it brings fear into your life. Because if you don't know what God's going to do, then how in the world are you going to get through tomorrow? When all hell breaks loose in your city, in your territory, in your state, what, 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 how do you operate? This is why people are filled with fear. And it's foundational in their belief system to God. God's never going to change. His promises remain the same. The promises in the old get uh, brought into the new and we are even given better promises. The, 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 the children of Israel, the Jews, understood this. Now, it didn't mean they handled it all properly, but they understood it. And sometimes Christians ought, to, I look at it, and Christians ought to learn from their Jewish brothers. They ought to learn some things because they had an understanding of God that is totally missed in Christendom. Now, I'm not saying to go back and do all the same things that we've been freed from. Galatians is very, very clear that we've been set free from uh, those different things. 
But the law became fulfilled in Jesus, and then Jesus gave us a commandment. He gave us one commandment and said, love one another. And all of the law is fulfilled in one word called love. And perfect love, guess what? Casts out fear. You can live on this earth fearless. But one of the foundational things, you have to look at who you actually think God is. What's His character? Now, let me, let me ask you something. Is it a big deal what kind of character your pastor has? Is that a big deal to you? If I would have major character flaws... How would you handle that? You'd kind of have a problem. And you should. You'd confront me. Well, thank God. Found somebody that's honest. And he'd confront the pastor if he has character flaws. But yet we say God has character flaws. I'm saying Christendom. I'm saying in, in, in Christian, he has, he has character flaws because it's in the mystery of what he wants to do. And we'll just never know. See, God is a, he, he, the character comes from him. He, he has the ultimate perfect character. And if he says, thou shalt not murder, how many know uh, it's translated thou shalt not kill in the English? If you look up that Hebrew word, it's actually thou shalt not murder. If he says, that thou shalt not murder, then we have people excusing God of taking people's lives on this earth. That's called murder. Is that too much for you to handle? Got really quiet in here. Can, can you stomach that? See, God will not do things and require things that he himself doesn't do. And here's the danger with this. When you believe that God did these things, and God, by his um, sovereign force, is up there pulling level, levers, and we're just puppets down here, and, and you know we're just doing what God is going to do down here, then you begin, there will be a time in your life if that's your understanding of God, there'll be a time in your life you'll question His character. This is why Christians get angry at God. This is why they shake their fists at Him. This is why they're so upset be, and, and, and because they're against what they believe God is doing and, and, and it, it devastates them. we got to understand that God's not the author of these things. There's a real enemy in this world. He goes about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's looking for those people that they look like a good meal. I mean, you watch a Discovery Channel and, and, and you know, like the lions kind of got it figured out. The herd of wildebeest goes by and I mean, there's like zoom, zoom, zoom. I mean, and, and then they, I watched a video not too long ago where they attempted to get a healthy one. And it didn't, it didn't go over so well for the lion. And then they eventually, they wisen up and they're like, you know, let's get the one that's limping. And then they begin to prey on the ones that are not strong. And, and the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's John 10, verse 10. The thief. Even you can take, uh, we talked about pleading the blood and putting the blood over the doorposts. It says right in Exodus is that the destroyer had to pass over. The destroyer. God is not the destroyer in your life. He's the blesser. Amen? Now, some people hear when I say these things, <clears throat> and immediately they go to, well, Jay, Pastor Jay, you're saying there's nothing bad going to happen to me. Did I say that? Have I said that? Have I been saying that? 
But it's where some people, they, they hear this. And I don't know where they hear this, except that Jesus says that we ought to be careful how we hear. So apparently, people can hear things that are not said. I never said you're going to just live a life of, of roses. In fact, the Scripture promises persecution. Go to Mark chapter 4. Let's just go to Mark chapter 4. Is this, is this uh, good for you tonight? Is anybody getting something out of this? I hope you are, because I sure did. And if you're not, ask the Lord for you, if, to open your eyes that you can receive something tonight. Amen. Verse 17. Well, let's just... It's one of the... Uh, my fa- um, fa- um, favorite parables... Uh, verse 9, uh, Jesus, and he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Did they not have ears? They didn't have these floppy things of flesh on the side of their head? Yeah, they did. But he's saying it matters how you hear. So one of the things that we ought to be doing is, Holy Spirit, help us hear correctly. Help us hear what you're trying to say. Right? And and a little down late. Uh, d- uh, a couple of verses down, he begins to explain the parable. And he actually, is, it seems like he's a little shocked. He says, do you not understand the parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, who comes immediately? Satan. Is there a Satan in this world? Is there a devil robbing you of hearing correctly? Yes. The instant it lands in your heart, the Satan is already trying to rob it. I, I, I remember, uh, we're a tongue-talking t- church here, and we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And way back at the beginning, soon after we were Spirit-filled, I had a friend of mine that hosted a Bible, um, uh, a Bible study. This was back in Pennsylvania. And they had a gentleman show up at one of their Bible studies that prayed and asked the Lord for 38 years to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and to speak in other tongues. 38 years. He pled and believed and said, Lord, please, please give me this gift. He comes to the Bible study. Brother Levere Soper was there. Some of you know Levere. And Levere led this man in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, laid hands on him, and the man spoke in other tongues. Right there, it was evident. The next morning, he calls my friend, Matt, we got a problem. Matt's like, what's the problem? Um, I know I got baptized in the Holy Spirit last night, and, and, I, and I did that kind of babbling stuff, I think it was fake. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was fake. And he begins to dismiss everything that happened. And the devil came and stole from that man. See, he comes immediately. I've had a person, we laid hands on him, they got healed. In fact, he was going for surgery for his rotator cuff. And he, he comes to church and he could not lift his hand higher than this. He comes up in the altar. We lay hands on him. He's going like this. He's doing this and going, hey, I can praise Jesus. Hallelujah. I am the healed. I, oh, it's so wonderful. And the next morning I call him. Hey, how you doing, brother? Oh, yeah, well, you know, somewhere along the line last night, I don't know if I laid on it wrong or slept on it wrong, but my, my, I guess God just wants me to have this. Literally the words coming out of His mouth. Received healing, and the enemy comes, and he's trying to take the Word out of their heart. And so he accepted it, what, what, what can you do when people believe these 
crazy things. See, this is why it's easier to get an unbeliever healed. They weren't taught wrong. Now, don't get offended by that. I'm just telling you the truth. I, I can go over to Ukraine, and you can get an unbeliever, lay hands on them, they receive their healing, they're healed, and you can lead them to Jesus and get them filled with the Holy Spirit all in one kabang. Here in America, we've got to go step by step by step because they, were, they had 20 years of wrong teaching. 20 years, 10, 15, 30 years of what, what they thought God was, and, and God wasn't those things. I'm telling you, it matters. It matters what you believe. So, here, the, the enemy comes and steals. That's the first soil. Verse 16, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Has this happened to you? Have you immediately received some things in faith? And then a week later, you're questioning on whether, uh, I don't know about that. Well, you just found stony ground in your heart. You just found stony, heart, uh, stony ground in your heart. Now, you can pray and believe God that, that, heart, that your heart continues to become fallow ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time afterward when tribulation or persecution arises. Why does, it, why does tribulation and persecution arise? Because you were a bad person. Because you were a good person. Because you did something wrong. No. Why does tribulation and persecution come to you? Because of the word operating in you. That's why I, get cruci- I got crucified, um, crucified, fig- not, not literally, but figuratively by all my friends when we got Spirit-filled and I told them what the good news of the Gospel and that you can be baptized in the Spirit and you can do all these things and God wants to prosper you, He wants to bless you. And I mean, it wasn't more than two, three weeks go by and it was like, ah, yeah, that health and wealth Gospel. And, and they cut ties with me. They wouldn't hang out with me. That's persecution. When your friend's reject, rejection for the Word's sake is persecution. If you get strong on what the Word says in your life, you will face persecution. A lot of times from your Christian friends. How much persecution are you experiencing? How much Word are you digesting? How, may, how, much word, how much word is coming up in faith out of you, right? And, and you know what? You can get past the stony ground. You can get the good ground. You can even get... There is fruit that comes from believing the Word of God. It doesn't always happen immediate. There's things in Kim and I's life that we've waited 10 to 12 years to see the fruit. And, and now you might look at it and say, oh, wow, uh, Jay and Kim, they have it so easy. Everything just falls into place for them. But it didn't at one point. There was a time our lives were a wreck. And we're hanging on to everything we could. We face persecution from every side. We face persecution from parents. We face persecution from friends. From uh, uh, people that... Uh, acquaintances. And, and rejection was a real thing. It, can, it comes because of the word's sake. Now, we weren't publicly burned at the stake, but we were in private little uh, gossip groups. Oh, did I, did I step on somebody's toes on that? No, we weren't, we weren't publicly taken to the stake and burned, but we were privately burned at the stake in many different gossip groups. Did you hear about Jay and Kim? No, I don't hold that against them. I'm just telling you, I'm exposing some things. You will face persecution on this earth. So we can do it without fear. You don't need to operate in fear. In other words, when the Word works in you the way it ought to, it will rise up. You will become so bold in what the Word says that you no longer care. You no longer care. You don't care about what's said about you. You don't care um, uh, uh, what the person thinks about you because you're passionate about doing what the Word says. And it will take the fear away. We had multiple different things in our lives 
that we faced fear. We were tempted to fear and even in, in a lot of instances gave in to the temptation to fear and it held us back. And we began to realize that, you know what, if we take this subject that I'm not clear about and we begin to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal this subject to us, we got so bold in it and the fear leaves. Now, instead of avoiding the subject, when you know, you're proclaiming it from the mountaintops. You know what? This is what the Word says. This is what the Word says about your life. It's part of the reason I get up and say, you know what? If you say you hate the prosperity gospel, you hate good news. And you're going to reject, you're going to already begin to reject the blessing that has already happened in your life. It, you're already blessed. I didn't give this stat. I've given it before. Two to three percent of the people of the world have flown in an airplane. And I bet you 99, if not 100 percent of people here have probably traveled in an airplane sometime in their life. You know, two to three percent of the world are the only ones that fly in airplanes. You have been given so many things. So, so if you reject that the gospel prospers you, then you reject the blessing that God is trying to get over you to you. And He's not trying to get you the blessing just um, so that you can, uh, in James it talks about, burn it on your own lust. He's trying to get it over to you so that you can make a difference in this earth. He wants you to make a difference. Jesus calls money the least of these things. And if you don't get clear on that, how are you going to get clear on the most? You've got to get through the least. And, and money, a lot of times, is a stumbling block to people because they don't understand it. They already ha are guilty. They're already ashamed of the things that God has already blessed them with, and they don't know how to, what to do with it. So instead of finding out and getting clear about it on what the Word says, they just ignore it, run from it, operate in that, and talk bad about other people. I worked in Aspen for a number of years, and I, there are so many people... The instant I said, hey, you know, uh, yeah, we, uh, they were like, hey, what do you do for a living? Well, you know, we uh, do a lot of work up in Aspen doing hardwood floors uh, for, for people up there. And, and, and immediately their eyes would just get big. They're like, oh, oh. Isn't it just sad how they throw around, throw around their wealth? Isn't it just awful how they, how they handle money? And I just look at them and I say, well, I'm really not going to have an opinion about it. I'm kind of glad they're throwing their money around because it gave me a job. It, put, it employed me. And so in other words, their riches trickled down to me. I, I, I'm kind of glad they built the house. And, and we'd look at plans. We'd open these plans. I'd be like, honey, this is 6,000 square foot of wood floors. Isn't it awesome? And there was some times where I'm looking at the plans and I'm like, man, 2,000 square foot of wood floors. Why can't they have three or four? <laughs> you know, because it's a lot of carpet. And I'm like, carpet? Why are they putting carpet in? They ought to be putting wood floors in their bedrooms, right? And, and I always, I knew when people would talk uh, to me about those rich people, I knew I had to shut my mouth, and I would. Because if I start speaking against it, I just compared myself to them, and the Bushman from Africa can show up and compare himself to me. And it's the same thing. And the Bible's not into comparison games. In fact, it says don't compare it's not wise, right, to compare one to another. It, the Bible works, the Word works for every person that works it. It is good news to the poor. And if it's good news to the poor, then my economic outlook starts not, like I don't have to look at what I think is going to happen in 2024 economically. It was, it's good news to the poor. I'm not on the economy of the world. I'm on the economy of God's blessing. And so now that begins to remove fear out of me. Hey, I, I was a bit, I, I'm a businessman. Thoughts go through my head too. Well, what if this really good business deal I got going for me dries up? 
What am I going to do then? What if it isn't anymore? What if it stops? In fact, there was a fear that I dealt with through this past summer that was just kind of gurgitating in me and I didn't know what to do with it. And it was the fear of what if this really good business deal we have going right now quits? And I had to get clear on some scripture. I had to take the word and begin to apply it. You know what? It doesn't matter if it does or if it doesn't. It's irrelevant. God promised He's going to take care of me, period. And if He told me He's going to take care of me, see, now the character of God, I have to begin to depend on the character of God in my life. And if my character of God, if my view of God is skewed, it will affect how I walk life, and I will be in fear. Because let me tell you, if God doesn't have it figured out, there ain't anybody else that's going to have it figured out. And we have a skewed view, often. Christians have a skewed view of who God actually and really is. Tonight, maybe I gave you some things to start renewing your mind about. God is a good God. He's so good that He tells me that His goodness is what leads us to repentance. How does that work? You remember the story of Peter? He got frustrated with this whole not Jesus, Jesus wasn't around thing. Like, Jesus had just died on the cross, and Peter's pretty upset about it, as I can see why, right? And he goes, I go a-fishing. He goes back to what he was used to doing. He was a fisherman all of his life until he followed Jesus for three years. And so he goes, I go a-fishing. So he goes a-fishing. And he fishes all night and can't catch a thing. I mean, it's a bad deal when a fisherman can't catch a thing. (laughs) You know, if I go fishing and I don't catch a thing, you know, I'm not a fisherman. But this is what this guy did. He went fishing all of his life. He couldn't catch a thing. And he sees this figure on the beach. Didn't recognize who it was. And, And the figure goes, cast your nets over on the other side. And finally he responds to that. And he has the greatest haul of fish he's ever had in his life. It was so big, he falls to his knees in repentance and says, that's Jesus. That is how good God is. His goodness will lead you to repentance. And we need to understand how amazing He is. Because in the next year, in the next two years, in the next five years, we are going to have to trust in the character of our God more than we ever have. The world is uncertain, but not us. We live in certain times with a certain God. And because of that bedrock of understanding that He's a certain God, He does not change. The same God that created Adam and at the end of the sixth day, after everything was created and everything was what? Everything was good. He places the crowning jewel of His creation into the middle of the garden, man. And Adam's eyes open as life is breathed into him. And God had made everything for him. That same God is your God. That same God, that goodness, that amazingness is the character of your God. 
That is why we can then live fearless. We've been, we already have addressed that there's promised persecution. There's going to be persecution. So why are we in fear when persecution happens? It's like we didn't, never read our Bible. And, and when it says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and we're shocked that there's another war. This is what was said was going to happen. And it doesn't have to unsettle us. In fact, we simply, we go back to, I know God's character. Well, if God's character is so amazing, why does he let those bad things happen? Because sin has corrupted man. It was never God's intention for man to sin. They did it. They decided it. They brought it. Man has brought sin on themselves. We now live in a fallen world, but we are to fight the good fight of faith in this fallen world. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. You live in a certain time and you live fearless. I have scripture verses for all these different uh, uh, phrases I said. God works in mysterious ways. God's ways are higher than our ways. We're not promised tomorrow. We will wait and see what the Lord has for us. See, see when, when, when you say these things, well, we'll wait and see. See what God has for me. When you, when you say some of these things, see, now, there's no responsibility for me to pray and see what God has. It's all on, well, we'll see what God brings to me because everything in life is God bringing something to me. No. He's not okay with sin. He's not okay with destruction. He's not okay with wickedness. He's not okay with evil. Yet it's happening... And then you say, well, God just allowed it. As if he was, uh, he's back there going, hmm, you know, I guess I'll let this happen for a bit. No, God wants nothing to do with any of this. And he has put you here to fight against it. You're here to fight the good fight of faith. Who's to resist evil? We are. Well, how do you resist evil if God's doing it all? You can't, and you never will. That's why you pray. God's going to do it all anyway? Why in the tarnation would you spend waste time praying? He's just going to do whatever He's going to do anyway. Because you can change things with your prayers. You can change this world. You can change your environment through your praying. Now, it's not just spouting whatever off at the mouth. It's praying the Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's another, here's another one. Seeing is believing. No, 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 no. That's not faith. Whoever thought that phrase up, seeing is believing, is as dead wrong as you can get. In fact, Scripture says it's the things that you don't see. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for each person here tonight. Father, I just... I know I said some things that they're processing. And Father, I ask the Holy Spirit to teach and guide them, not just because I said it, but because what your word says about your character. Father, cause them to become hungry for your word and dig and look and prove what you said. Not because I said it, but because of what you said, Lord. And Father, I thank you and praise you that you are the light bringer, the light bearer, and you bring light to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hallelujah. I will be gone this next week, so don't fall apart like a $2 suitcase while I'm gone. <laughs> I say that in jest. Uh, I don't think that's ever happened. Um, but I will be out of town. I I'm flying to Florida for this next week. have some things happening down there. And um, I'll be back for next Saturday's service. So pray that my flights 
uh, are on time, no delays, in the name of Jesus. Because the Lord is willing for me to go. He's spoken to me about it, and He is willing. And I think we're going to talk about uh, one of these, one of these it's, that's been kind of percolating in me to address how he, what he's talking about in James, about asking uh, if, if the Lord wills go here, if the Lord wills go there, and bring some more clarity out of that subject. So I don't know if that's next week. I'm just saying it's, sometimes sermons are percolating for months, and I don't always know when I'm going to share them. Uh, but I will be gone. I'm going to be with Pastor Sidney, so we're going to have a great time, and we're going to continue to fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Amen. Kim and I love you, and uh, I think Monday uh, prayer, uh, Wednesday evening Bible study is taken care of, and uh, thank you, Jesus. Stay hungry, stay in the Word, and if I said something that offended you tonight, please don't be offended. I'm not meaning it as offensive. I'm hoping that you Get your Bible open and you study it and you look and truly see the character of God because he's such a good God. Amen? Love you all. You're dismissed.